And now, the international Vienna for everyone. And now, the international Vienna for everyone. Has you brought all your books here? Uh, not all of them, no. Um, just a, 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 a few. I, I've had 24 published altogether, so... How many? 24. I only managed to find about uh, seven or eight. Okay, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah the different publishers work for different publishers and or I'm published by different publishers, so it depends where you look. How does it feel to be published several times by Penguin? Uh, it's one of the greatest. Yeah, that's a little bit of a cheat. Uh, Why? Well, because I was published by... Random House. So right. I was contracted by Random House and I worked with a Random House editor and uh, and then Penguin bought Random House. So I just automatically became a, a Penguin author. <laughs> <laughs> so I was originally uh, published by Random House. But uh, Random House was smaller? Uh, smaller, yeah. There were, it's a slightly smaller publisher. They were, they were still huge and now Penguin Random House publishers, I, I think they're the biggest in the world. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I was never um, officially contracted or paid by Penguin mm -hmm. until they bought Random House, who were my first publishers. How was your first experience of being published? Did you struggle a lot? Did you get a lot of rejections before publishing the first book? Yeah. Which one was the first one? The first one was a book called Creepers, which... Uh, you have it here with you? It's me uh, now because it was first published in 1996. Uh -huh. um, so the book's not far off, uh, coming up to, um, you know, 30 years old. Mm -hmm. um, but I wanted to be a writer when I was at school. I, I wasn't very academic. I didn't do particularly well in my exams at school. I don't have um, paper qualifications. Um, I went to university for a year, um, but was asked to leave at, that, at the end of that first year. You were asked to leave? Yeah, I got, Why? I got 0% in my accountancy exams. I was doing business and finance at university. Uh, in the UK, got no percent in my accountancy exams, and they basically said, "This isn't for you." They said, "Keith, this isn't really where your heart is." Um, I'd, all the way through school, I'd always been writing stories uh, and giving them to my mates to read and things like that. And so I came out of university, and it was okay. I'm twenty, twenty-one years old. Mm -hmm. I want to be a writer. Can I make it happen? So I took lots of little part-time jobs along the way, working in bars, working as a gardener. Uh, I used to dress up as a six foot teddy bear for a local um, in the UK in the UK for a local theme park fun fair kind of thing uh, as their mascot. So I did lots and lots of little jobs, um, pizza restaurants and that kind of thing, while I wrote my first book, which I sent to eight different publishers. And back in those days, it was before email, so I had to prepare a huge folder, of printed it documents. out, huge you know manuscript. Uh, put it in a big fat envelope and send it out and pay the postage and everything. And I sent it to eight different publishers and eight different publishers sent it back, said they didn't want it. Um, but I refused to give up. So I wrote a second book, sent that to 12 different publishers. 12 different publishers sent my second book back and said, no, that's not good enough. Uh, and by this point, my parents are saying, get a proper job. What are you doing with your life? Get a proper job. But I wrote my third book, which was Creepers. Um, which I sent out to, I think it was the ninth publisher, picked that up and said, yes, we'll publish this. So, What, what, what publishing house was it? This was with um, a publishing house that, uh, it's changed its name over the years and it's now called Egmont. Oh. Uh, and Egmont, they're a, a, originally a Dutch company, but they've got fingers in lots of publishing pies around the world. Um, and Egmont said yes, and um, and I've not looked back, basically. You know, um, I've... I, always then been on contract to write another book, to write another book, to write another book. Um, it took me a while before it could become a full-time job. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, Which now is? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, I um, uh, there's other things that, that, uh, that you can do as a... As, I don't know many novelists that are only yeah, novelists. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, um, I visit schools and talk to kids about, uh, yeah. as I write for young people, so I can visit schools and talk to kids about books and reading and writing. And of course, that's part of the income. And I, I've reviewed for the Guardian newspaper and the Scotsman newspaper, mm -hmm. kids' books. So that's part of the income. You have greater reviews of books. I read some of them that are on the Penguin website on the at the end of the page down there. Uh, yeah. Reviews for the Guardian, uh, Sunday Times. Yeah, I, well, I'm... I'm a writer that relies quite a lot on reviews. Yeah, so I'm, I'm not a, I'm, I think there's, I'm not a best-selling author. 
I'm not a, I've never had a Hollywood screenplay or anything like that. So the way people discover my books is because I've been lucky enough to be well-reviewed in Mm. uh, newspapers or uh, I've hit a couple of uh, literary, literary prize shortlists uh, and things like this and that's kind of what keeps my kind of books ticking over until obviously I get that huge Hollywood deal and, <laughs> and I live on a beach things like that and what happened after the first book got published so what was the next thing you sold a lot of copies uh, or they just contracted you right away for the next book well they, they did um Yeah, the very first thing I did actually was get very, very drunk. I was very, very happy. Uh, it was a big celebration because uh, it taken me a long time and a lot of rejections. Um, How many years since the first uh, submission with the first? It would have taken about three, four years. So three full length novels. You know, I'm talking about, I know I, I say I write for young people, but I'm talking about at least 60,000 word novels. Um, three of those and lots and lots of hard work and lots of working part-time jobs mm-hmm. sort of working part-time jobs to be able to pay the rent and trying to scribble stories at night kind of thing um so but what publishers do when they pick you up for a book um there's a clause in your contract they say yes we'll publish this book but we want to see your next book mm-hmm. and we choose whether we want it or not And if we don't want it, then you can take it to other publishers. But if we do want it, that book stays with us. So publishers often have this first, you know, first chance clause in their contracts. Uh, you can sign contract for three or four book deals, uh, but I've usually stuck to single book deals. Do they give you guidelines or what they're expecting from you, like the topic or the setting or something? Or they just say, write whatever you want, and if we like it, we'll keep it? Yeah, I'm lucky that I'm allowed to write whatever I want. That's great. Uh, it goes through an editorial process where you know, course, we yeah. talk backwards and forwards about the book. But um, no, I'm, I'm quite lucky. And, and I, I claim that I'm a young adult writer or a teenage writer. Um, and you see Creepers uh, being published in 1996. That was before the term YA, young adult fiction, even existed. So I was kind of writing this new this new slice of literature called YA fiction bef- before it really existed. But I wasn't alone. There's quite a few of us doing it. I'll just put your microphone a bit closer to yourself. You can stay however you want. And I'll just, put, yeah, if you're comfortable there, yeah. I'll bring the microphone to you. Okay. Uh, I'm getting overexcited, you see, talking about kids. But... <laughs> It's slowly go ahead. Um, and so uh, so I was doing something that I didn't realize it was new at the time, and I'm, I'm not claiming at all I was the only one doing it. There was quite a few people out there doing it, but it was before the publishers or the market or the Started readers... to define it. Uh, yeah, defined it as a, as a label. Mm. Um, and so because my career goes back quite a few years, I, I'm, I'm just trusted, luckily, I'm trusted to produce a book that... It, it, It's not going to be perfect. Mm-hmm. There's going to be editorials. There's going to be talks about where the book goes and how it works. Um, but I'm trusted to write what I'd like to write, uh, mm-hmm. which is which is lovely, which is great. And since then, have you always stuck to young adults fiction? Yeah, I've written I've written a few books for younger kids, so what we call middle grade, so kind of eight to ten year olds. I've written a couple of books for that age group, um, and I've written one or two short stories for adults. But I, I love writing about um, the teenage years. Um, I'm a bit worried at the minute because I'm kind of, I'm now 52. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, nearly 52. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I, I, I just think that maybe it's time for me to, to move on, to do... I've got a few colleagues of my age and they've either started writing middle grade, they've gone younger in years, or they've started writing for adults. And maybe I'm going to hit that crossroads in my career where I need to decide because I just don't want to be the, the drunken uncle dancing at the wedding. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Thinking that I'm cool with the teenagers. I, just, yeah. I don't want that to happen at all. Uh, your latest published book, is it The Ostrich Boy? Ost- no, Ostrich Boys is a few years old now. The latest one... 2008, right? Yeah, 2008 was Ostrich Boys. Uh, the newest one uh, is The Den, which just the Den. came out this August. Can I see it? Okay. What no. is it about? Um, Can I read this on the back? Yeah, if you'd like to, yeah. Marshall feels the need to escape because things are so tough at home. Rory is just happy it's just the first day of the summer holiday. While out on their bikes, they stumble across a long forgotten underground bunker at the edge of the woods. This is the den, and going down inside will stretch their friendship to its limits. There will be rivalry and betrayal, but... Uh, 
can wrecked relationship relationship be saved before the summer has even begun? And I see you already got a lot of nice reviews. A master of teenage voice, I savor every word he writes. This Phil Earl says about you. We'll have you greedily turning each page, says Brian Conaghan. That's great. I'm looking forward to read this. When when did this come out? It just came out in August. In August, um, yeah. So it's just uh, a couple of months ago, and uh, it, uh, I, I write a lot about um, young men, a lot about mm -hmm. uh, male uh, adolescents. Yeah, I read the, a little that the Ostrich Boy is based on uh, on your life partially. Is it true? Um, or uh, how much is it based on your real life? A little bit. Ostrich Boys um, deals with, or one of the threats in Ostrich Boys deals with teenage suicide. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that's something that I've experienced in my life sort of thing. Um, and so Ostrich Boys was written, there was quite a few books coming out in the 2000s when YA was getting bigger and bigger sort of mm -hmm. thing. Um and there's quite a few books that came out that was dealing with uh, suicide and with mental health before. I mean, nowadays we talk a lot about mental health but yeah. before we really talked a lot about it. And um, I was reading these books and I was thinking that that doesn't ring true for me. That doesn't seem quite honest enough for the young readership who may be having mental health problems or maybe having suicidal thoughts or know a member of the family. Uh, and at that time I was living in Scotland in Edinburgh and the statistics were that the biggest killer of young men under the age of 25 was suicide. Um, and so I wanted to write a book that dealt with it and dealt with it as honestly as possible. But the kind of the trick with writing for young people is you've got to give them the story first. Mm. They don't want to be... Um, they don't want to hear you uh, preach them. They don't want, they want the story. Yeah, they don't want to be preached to. They don't want to be patronised. They don't want mansplaining or, or adult splaining yeah. going on. Um, so it was finding a story that could carry that kind of theme and talk about those kind of ideas. Um, and and also I was very lucky that Ostrich Boys was a, it, it's still my most successful book. It was made into a, a theatre play and yeah. it's um, it's been in the UK and in as far afield as uh, Seoul, South Korea, Mumbai and India. Oh, wow. So it, it, it did really well, Ostrich Boys, yeah. How does it work when they want to turn it into a play? Do they pay you royalties or the copyrights or do you just give them the permission? That's it. Well, they, uh, I guess it depends. It depends on the contract you sign with mm. the publishers because the publishers kind of... It, oh, it's them who's going to deal with it. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I, I don't want to... Uh, it's horrible. It does depend. Horrible to say. It's not horrible to say. I mean, it's complicated to say. It, it, you could sign a contract with a publisher where all they get is the print right of the books mm -hmm. and they'll pay you X amount of pounds or euros for that book. But if you sign a contract with a publisher and you say, we will also give you, or me as the author, will also give you the right to sell the theatre version of it or the TV film version of it or the audible version of it or whatever, then um, the publishers may pay you a bigger chunk of money up front to buy the book because they're buying other rights mm -hmm. to go with it. And my theory has always been, I wouldn't know how the hell to sell a stage play of one yeah. of my books, so I, I'll leave that up to yeah. the publishers. So I'll allow the publishers to try to sell the stage play. But then, of course, when they sell the stage play, they get a cut of the money and I get a cut of the money so it's oh, fair play because you're not really working anymore on the play or for the deal and they do the job with for you and it's fair enough that they also get a cut exactly yeah exactly exactly like that so um so I, I and I've been lucky my publishers have been you know as fair as I know that they've been over the years and I have a, a literary agent and she's kind of the she does the business side of things mm -hmm. for me. So I write the books. My literary agent deals with the contracts mm -hmm. uh, and deals with the publishers. And that's really nice. It's because my editor that I work with at Penguin Random House or wherever, um, we will just talk about the book. Mm -hmm. We won't talk about the money. We yeah. won't talk about the rights. We won't talk about the theatre or anything like that. We just talk about the story and the characters. Um my agent, she can have the arguments with the editor mm -hmm. if there's any, you know, about the contract or whatever. So it, it, an, an agent's kind of a bit like a shield or an umbrella, yeah. which is quite nice. Uh, it's like your advocate. 
Yes, yeah, those in a way. Cases. Going back to those two first books or manus- manuscripts that didn't end up being published, if you go back reading them now, do you think they're worth publishing after you, like it's, it's 20, 30 years ago almost? Yeah. No, the, and when, when was it the first? Attempt? Well, I, I, wrote my, I would have written my first full length novel when I was about 18, 19. So that was, you know, going back to about 1990, 1991. Mm-hmm. Uh, so no, it's, years ago. it's absolutely terrible. It's yeah. appalling. <laughs> yes, it, it's shocking. That's what I was going to ask. It, usually, uh, especially writers get frustrated when they get rejected. And I hear a lot of these stories like, uh, I don't know, J.K. Rowling first manuscript was rejected of her, the manuscript of Harry Potter. Uh, but I'm pretty sure that it wasn't as good as the manuscript that it ended up being published. And a lot of people don't say that. Don't say that the first manuscript is not as good as to be published that it needs a lot of rework and it's not ready, it's not there yet. And they consider like, if, if you'd end up publishing the first manuscript, you would probably rework on it or do something different if you get feedback from the publishers. And then you wouldn't say that uh, this is the, the book that was rejected nine times or eight times. It, this is the same theme and topic, but this is a different book. That's why it's being published now. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I think that's a yeah, absolutely. Um, there's a you know, there's people there in the publishing house. It's their job to help you, yeah, not steal your ideas, yeah, not write the book for. Yeah, they want the money as well to help make that book as good as yeah. possible to to hit as many readers as possible. You know, so um, so now my very first book it was a horror story. Um, I, when I was a teenager, I wanted to be Stephen King, and yeah. my big ambition. Um, and it, so it was a horror book, a rip-off of a Stephen King, and it's, it's absolutely awful. But the thing was, I learned how to. I learned that I could write a novel. Mm. I could write sixty thousand words yeah. at the beginning, middle, and end. I never knew I could do that before. And once you've done it once, I'm not saying it gets easier. It's just you believe that you can get through the next novel. Yeah. And so, um, so yeah, the first one was awful. The second one, I rewrote it completely, similar to how you're talking, and it mm. did get published eventually. It was, I think it was maybe my fourth or fifth book that I had published. It was the second book, massively yeah. reworked, massively rewritten, but with the same characters, the same theme, yeah. and the same idea behind it. But a lot of people would use that just for a bit of internet motivational uh, post they would say, hey, this is the book that got rejected 12 times by 12 publisher, but they would never say that they reworked 90% of the book That's right. now that it's published. And the, and the difficult thing is actually, that I haven't met an artist who's happy, you know, <laughs> we, we all get a bit, yeah. uh, a bit, oh, I wish I'd done that better, or I, I'm sure... I'm not comparing myself to the Beatles at all, but I'm sure they'd go back and go, oh, that chorus was a bit poor. We should have done something better with that chorus or yeah. that chord change. And I think that's that's the same with, with authors. You know, I'm sure it, it, whoever went back to read their old books would go, hmm, I could maybe, you know, maybe I could explain that a little better or I could cut that chapter for pace. Yeah. Um, and that's why I'm a little bit jealous, I suppose, of musicians because up on stage they can change their songs <laughs> as they go from concert yeah. to concert. Yeah. Whereas as a novelist, that's it. It's yeah. black and white. Yeah. It's on the page. You can't True. change what you wrote 30 years ago, you know? Yeah. Uh, and you still publish in the UK, right? Yes. Your yeah, maybe there. published in the UK. I, I, I do get published um, in, in other countries. So, no, I mean, but your, your first uh, contact, your publisher, your agent, they're in the UK. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And... Then what? It seems like things were going fine over there. Why? What brings you to Vienna? Love. Uh, you're one of those guys. I'm one of those guys. I'm a trailing <laughs> spouse. Yeah. Um, my partner, um, who I met when she was studying in Edinburgh in Scotland, um, she's originally from Vienna. Okay. And we have a daughter. Oh. And uh, Brexit happened, uh, and my father passed away, and we wanted to bring up our daughter bilingual, and lots of the. I'd, um, I was mid forties when I came over here, um, and it felt like a a challenge at that time in life to try something new and different. And it's still a challenge. I think it's a challenge living in a country that's not your country of mm. birth and not your native language and things like that yeah i think it's a challenge and living this close to your in-laws i think that's <laughs> that's quite quite a challenge yeah how are you doing with german um ich lerne deutsch langsam <laughs> um, and i do struggle um 
I can get by in shops and restaurants, um, no problem at all. But conversations, I really struggle to hold conversations. And you'll often find that my 11-year-old daughter will push me out of the way and speak for me because she's embarrassed by my stuttering, slow attempts at German and the, the terribleness of my, my accent. Um, I'm, I'm kind of getting there. But I work all day in the English language. You know, I spend all day at a desk trying to find the best words in English. Mm. And then when I um, come to speak German, I get so frustrated with myself that I'm not as clever, cool or witty <laughs> in German as I, I like to think I am in English. You say you're working all day. What, what is your day? In writing, my day in writing is. Um, you just published a book, for example. You're still writing now. Every yeah, I'm on. I've just. Well, I've just finished the next book. You f you finished already? Yeah. What happens is it takes about a year for a book to be published. Uh -huh. So I literally. Uh, so oh, September the twentieth um, of twenty twenty three, I submitted my novel, which will not be published until August twenty twenty four. So you kind of uh, uh, you work a year in advance because like the iPhone yeah, pretty much I guess yeah <laughs> yeah. I'd not thought of it like that but yeah I submit a book uh, so I've, this book I've just submitted in September 2023 it will go through the editorial process we will look for a cover illustrator we will discuss the cover and what the cover's going to look like the book will then be copy edited for grammar, grammatical and spelling mistakes uh, the book will then go to the marketing department and the publicists to see how they feel they want to publicize and, and market the book whether whether they've got budget to make you a nice poster mm -hmm. or they've got a budget to send you on a podcast or send mm -hmm. you to a, a book festival to talk about your book um, all that will be discussed um, then they often produce what's known as a proof copy mm -hmm. which is um, a very cheap version of your book and that may get sent out to newspapers or to fellow authors really? yet for early reviews a lot of the time nowadays they just send PDFs as well for people to read uh, and then that if we get any nice quotes back then that will be added to the cover yeah. design and then the book eventually will be printed mm. and eventually will come out so it's about a year long process from me handing in a first book not, maybe not a first draft but me handing the book into the publishers of what I'm as good as I can make it to then it coming out on the shelves now that you've written 24 books right yeah Uh, is the uh, editing, for example, when the editor sends it back to you for changes, does it take you the same time that it used to take it 20 years ago? Or? That's a really good question. Um, you see, 20 years ago, I didn't have a clue how publishing worked. So I was very much, yeah, yeah, I'll do that. Yeah, yeah, I'll change that. Oh, yeah, I'll change that. <laughs> Now You just wanted to be published. Because I just wanted to be published, yeah. And I was so grateful to be published. I'm from a very small town mm. in England where... Um, Grins, uh, Grimsby. Grimsby. Yeah. Grimsby. And grim in English means miserable and dark and okay. unhappy. So and my town is known as Grimsby. Um, and I, I'd never met... I was the first published author I'd ever met. You know, I, I'd never met a writer before in my life. Um, and so for me, it was like, wow, this is fantastic. I'll say yes to anything. You know, you want me to jump? How high? Whereas nowadays, my problem is um, I've won book awards and I've sold, you know, I'm not a bestseller, but I've sold a few books here and there. So I argue harder. Yeah. <laughs> over the years. You know, your, your own potential, you're aware of it, let's say. And I try to keep that in check a little bit because what I've also discovered, luckily through experience, is that editors can be brilliant. And if you click yeah. with an editor, if you get a relationship going with an editor, um, the editor is solely there to make me look good. Yeah. And so if I think I look good, that editor could maybe make me look better. Yeah. Uh, and I've learned that over the years as well. So it's a balancing act of, no, I really want to keep that sentence or no I really like the direction of that story compared to the editor saying have you thought about this mm. and I often find that working with an editor is like a, a long line of dominoes the editor mm. will flick over the first domino with an idea and I don't like so. that first idea yeah. as those dominoes topple 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 mm. oh yes I do like what it's led up to and so sometimes there's a, a really lovely meeting of minds with an editor so do you think that 
a lot of Hemingway and Fitzgerald book wouldn't be the same without Maxwell Perkins. It's possible. I mean, I, 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 I had no idea about their relationship. I mean, there's a story in the... I don't know how true it is, but a story I heard very early on, Norman Mailer, the, the author Norman Mailer, mm -hmm. American writer, he was asked to change a single sentence in one of his books. I can't tell you what book it was, I'm afraid, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. But it, the story is that his editor said to him at his publishing house, um, this sentence doesn't work, we don't like it. Could you change it or remove it? So Norman Mailer changed publishers instead. Really? He refused to change that single sentence. So he only has uh, published 100% of what he has written. It could be so. Now, there's all sorts of stories floating around, you know, but whatever sort of arty farty thing you do, isn't it? That's very rare. So That's very rare. But I suppose if you're as huge as he was, um, as influential as he was, as best-selling as he was, maybe that's the kind of power that some of these people can I don't know. It, it could be the power. I mean, in the sense, he has the power to publish his books however he wants. But on the other hand, as a writer, you always need a, a second eye in your writing. I Another personally person think so. And I, I, we'll add allegedly to that story. <laughs> I'll add allegedly. To oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just in case. But, so, um, I'm just... Um, Yeah, I think writing's really hard. I think, um, and it is a lonely business sometimes. Uh, it's incredibly fulfilling and satisfying, but it's lonely, it's hard. And a second pair of eyes is wonderful. You know? mm. Absolutely. What were you reading when you decided to become a writer? Stephen King? A lot of Stephen King. Uh, Raymond Bradbury. Have you heard of Ray Bradbury? Yeah, the, uh, uh, Catcher in the Rye. Uh, no, that's something wicked way this, this way comes. Uh, a guy called Ray Bradbury. It was another horror. Oh, the, the, writer, actually. Uh, the, oh, I forgot the other. J.D. Salinger wrote Catcher in the Rye. Yeah, yeah. but I, I mistook it with the, uh, the the guy that burns the books. I forgot the name of the book. That is Ray Bradbury. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. But I'm saying, but I forgot the name of the book. With, um, uh, it's Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit. Uh, full five. Yes, one? yes, full five. Oh, five yes. So I was reading Ray Bradbury, Stephen King. But someone wrote in your reviews that uh, The Orchid Boy, if I'm not wrong, uh, it's like a mix between On the Road and The Catcher in the Ray. Which was really lovely. Yeah. Um, I don't know whether I'd agree with them, but it's a great quote. <laughs> yes. um, I think On the Road is a work of absolute yeah. genius. Uh, I think it's outstanding. I did. I've never enjoyed Catcher the Rye. I just, it just didn't work. That book didn't click for me. Different mm. books click with different personalities and different people. And I can see why Catcher the Rye is held in such high esteem as a technical accomplishment, mm -hmm. but as a... As well, it's, it's a coming of age yeah. book. And, and maybe that's, that's why, why they associate it with the Orchard. That's right? absolutely why they associate it yeah. with Ostrich Boys. Yeah, that's right. So you were saying about the books that inspired you before you started writing. Yeah, I, I can... But I can remember um, in my teenage years, it, it was Stephen King and that. But when I hit my 20s, I discovered a Scottish writer called Ian Banks, who's not particularly well known mm -hmm. outside of Scotland or outside of the UK. I loved his books and I'd highly recommend There's a book called The Crow Road by Ian Banks, which... Oh, I've stolen so many. Sorry, I've been inspired by so many pieces from that book. It just blew me away. Um, there's an Irish writer called Roddy Doyle. He wrote a book that became The, the Commitments, the movie. Um, it was a very, I think it won an Oscar maybe in the early 90s, the mm -hmm. movie. But Roddy Doyle, the Irish writer. Um, so what I kind of tried to do was, I love these, these authors that weren't quite highfalutin literary masterpieces but had a really good story to them I'm, I'm, a, I'm a real story driven writer but I like to I like to have big ideas and big emotions in my books as well um, but for me first and foremost is the story so I suppose Stephen King it's all about the story yeah. it's all about the story and what the characters do within that story but when you move on to some other writers who I love William Boyd David Mitchell a lot of that is about what the book's actually saying and what the book's making you feel and think. And for young people, I'm trying to mash up the two together. I'm trying to give your readers a really exciting story, um, which maybe feels a little bit rebellious, a little bit antisocial in what the kids in my books are doing. But I hope there's big emotion and big 
big ideas about uh, growing up and about coming of age in the books as well. Uh, probably as a Stephen King fan, you read his autobiography on writing, right? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. And he talks a lot about how he had his uh, drug problems and drinking problems and I'm not sure, gambling problems. I'm not sure, yeah. Maybe not that one, maybe uh, drinking and drugs. Drinking and drugs, definitely, yeah. But on the other hand, some of his greatest masterpieces were written when he was uh, during that period of time. What would you say about writing under uh, influences like that? Is it the real writer or do, do writers need some influence to really get deep into themselves so they can do their best or they just need to be in quiet and in silence and in their own private studio or villa or who knows? Well, we all have a, we all have method. What is yours? My method um, is is Red Bull and panic. Really, <laughs> I've got to hit the deadline. Um, no, but we, I, I think we all have a process and a. What words am I trying to find? I'm trying to say we all have a cocoon for when we're writing. We all try to block out the outside world, and if you're writing a first person narrative, I write a lot of first person narratives. I'm trying to block out my head because I don't want a 14-year-old to read one of my books and hear a 50-year-old person's voice. If they do, I've failed. Mm. I want them. I want a 14-year-old to read my book and hear the character's voice. Right. So we have to cocoon ourselves off. We have to block out, out our own head, our own thoughts, our own worries. Um, and... Maybe for some people that's drink and drugs. Mm. I've been lucky. Um, I enjoy whiskey a lot, uh, but I don't need whiskey to write. Mm -hmm. um, I use music a lot of the time. I have an old fashioned uh, CD player. I still have CDs, buy CDs, and um, I choose what music I'm going to listen to during that. During okay, I've got a. Um, I've, I've got to write a car chase. Okay, let's choose five CDs that are going to keep my blood mm. pumping and keep, and that that the noise from those CDs is going to block out the outside world. Uh, it's going to block out my own thoughts, and all I can hear is that pounding music. And I'll be able to write a really exciting car chase. That's an extreme exam example. Yeah. Aren't you bothered by the lyrics? No, not at all. When you know the song, get done, follow the lyrics. No, I've done it for you. It's been my process all my writing mm. life. Always had uh, music on in the background. And I know it's been a good writing day when I haven't heard the music. Mm. Right. The and music just becomes all there out make noise. So, um, so uh, now the, the, there's some people that would say, yeah, well, they you don't get into your inner soul and... Maybe if I did drugs or drink, I'd be a better writer, but I don't want to be a writer who does drugs and <laughs> gets drunk too much while they're writing. Not because I'm a children's writer. <laughs> I just kind of... I, 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 I don't feel it's necessary for, for me. Um, and I, it makes me wonder... So Stephen King wrote some of his classic novels, absolutely, when he was under the influence of cocaine mm. and when he was, you know, sort of drunk out. The Shining as well. He, um, he wrote The Shining. Um, uh, it was mainly his 80s output, I think, was when... Shawshank Redemption. I mean, the book has another title. It's not called The Shawshank Redemption. But uh, Rita Hayworth. Yeah. Uh, and the, uh, Rita Hayworth and The Shawshank Redemption is the full title, I think. Um, so he wrote some in incredible stuff. It. He wrote It. He doesn't remember parts of it, apparently, allegedly. That's what he said, yeah. Um, but then again, there's been a few books that he's published in the early 2000s, a book called Hearts in Atlantis, a book called Under the Dome, which are fantastic novels as well. Um, so is the drink and drugs just a crutch? Or did he need the drink and drugs to be a writer? Mm. Or did he need the drink and drugs for actually the rest of his life outside of the book? Yeah. Do you see? Did he need the drink and drugs for when he was writing fiction, or was actually the drink and drugs a crutch for the non-fiction of his real life, and the two got mixed up? I don't know. I have no idea. You know, um, I think he could have written them anyway, even without drugs. How you say he could have used music or something else just to isolate the world outside? 
Isolate, yeah. that's the better word. That's the word I was looking for. Yeah. Yeah. I tried to isolate. Well, that's, uh, that's something I should write down because I'm not a native English speaker <laughs> and I just gave a word to English. <laughs> that's, the, that's the word I was fighting for. But I was saying that in the book, he says that he started writing when he was 15 or something, that he writes his first book in high school and tries to sell it to the other students, which means that he was a writer. And yes. he wanted to be a writer. He maybe it's not he maybe wasn't the writer that he became later on, but he was a writer and he definitely did become a writer because he was under drugs or yeah. alcohol. So That's right, he was already a writer, yeah. as you say. Yeah. Uh, and I'm sure Kurt Cobain was already a musician. And, yeah, exactly. Um, you know. Uh, Amy Winehouse, that, I don't know. They were already, you know, she, that, she, that voice of Amy Winehouse, that amazing, yeah. amazing voice, uh, she didn't need drinking drugs yeah. to produce that. Yeah. And Heath Ledger was also an actor with that track. You know, so, uh, but I don't want to, there's no way I'd, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to sit here and on a high horse and preach down to, to those people. Who have, uh, and let's be honest. Many, many more people have heard of Amy Winehouse or Stephen King than have heard of me. So <laughs> maybe I'm choosing the wrong CDs. Well, you do. <laughs> you just bring me to my other question just by saying this that uh, do you think that Peter is automatically the same level with famous? That's not necessarily true, is it? No. Because you see, people don't know me, they know Amy Winehouse and Stephen King. But how does that make them better than you or than someone else that you know or than, than this uh, Scottish writer that you mentioned, for example? Yeah, uh, that, that's a really good question. It, it's the idea that, it's the idea how many people you touch. Say, so if we if we think about writers, um, what we want is readers. Mm -hmm. So the woman that wrote Fifty Shades of Grey, mm -hmm. have you heard of Fifty Shades of yeah. Grey, you know, which was a huge bestseller? Yeah. I haven't read the book, but I, 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 I tried reading it. I tried reading it. It wasn't for me. Okay. <laughs> but um, the, the idea is that she is well known as a, apparently as a terrible writer, that she's mm. not a very good writer. And yet her readership is huge. Massive, massive, massive. massive. But then you take a beautiful, incredible, amazing writer... Uh, uh, like uh, one of my favourites this Ian Banks that I mentioned this Scottish writer I, he's not even sold a tenth of the books that she's sold maybe he's not even you know, no he's very popular in, in Scotland maybe a tenth of the books he's sold so he's touched less people mm. in a sense with his fiction so who's the better writer or even Salman Rushdie Salman Rushdie yeah. hasn't sold as many books as Fifty Shades of Grey but are we going to say that Salman Rushdie is a worse yeah. writer, yeah. and and it's so it's that question of what makes good writing, what makes good stories. But I was also talking about Faye, for example, Fifty Shades of Grey. A lot of people know the name of the book, but I, I I think that not a lot of people know the name of the writer. On the other hand, a lot of people know the name of Salman Rushdie, but they don't know many titles of his book. That's interesting. <laughs> so he's a famous writer, and Fifty Shades of Grey is a famous book. Which on this case, we have a famous writer who we also consider that he's a better writer. So in this case, the, the thesis that famous and better go along wins. But we wouldn't necessarily agree that that's always the case. And I guess that's the, the, the case you were trying to, to set here. Trying to set there, yeah. I, I think it's such a... It's like, as I say, for me, um, Catching the Rye just doesn't do it for me. Mm. I just don't enjoy Catching the Rye. But there's many uh, of my friends that became writers because of Catching really? the Rye. Yeah, because they loved it so much. Um, but, but for me, I, you know, it's not on my bookshelf at home. Mm. Um, uh, I have it on my bookshelf if you aren't. Oh, that's great. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but that's what it means. But I'm not, but I don't think I'm wrong. I'm not quite, I'm, it's just, that's the problem with any kind of art, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? It, mm. it is, we try to, we try to quantify it by, as I say, giving it prizes, giving it reviews or whatever. But actually it's such an individual thing to the person experiencing that writing, that song, that painting. It, you know, art really is, uh, it, it, art doesn't work without an audience. I don't, I don't believe, people would argue with me against that. Mm. Um, but I don't think art works to its full potential without some kind of audience for that art. So 
in this sense, what is your approach towards uh, awards? You've won some and you were shortlisted for some others. And do you think they changed something? I mean, they might have changed definitely something in your wallet, but did they change something in you as a writer in the way you write or in your commitment to write? They did, but not anymore. So um, I was at my most prolific as a writer uh, in the 2000s. And that's when uh, I, my name was best known in, in the UK. You know, wasn't famous, but uh, going to a school, school library, and I'd be on a school library bookshelf. Um, so I was best, best known in the 2000s. And Ostrich Boys, this book we've mentioned before, in 2008, it was shortlisted for um, uh, a dozen awards, yeah. literary awards. Um, it went, for me, it went boom. And I couldn't follow it. I didn't know how to write another book to follow up that success. What do you mean? Uh, because I knew the next book would, or I felt the next book would have to be just as good or better. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know what to write about. Right. And I didn't Gosh. know if I could write about And I'd go back and I'd read a chapter from Ostrich Boys and go, how the, how the hell did I write that? <laughs> how on earth did I write that chapter? I cannot remember writing that chapter. You know, where did those words come from? And I panicked. I suddenly had this acclaim, if you like. And I know this, sorry, I'm, I'm desperately not trying to sound um, big headed about it or anything. Yeah. It was fantastic. It was lovely. But it, I just did not know how to follow Ostrich Boys up. And because Ostrich Boys was a personal book as well, because we've talked about it, um, mm. briefly touched on the suicide issue of it, it was, a, it was a personal book. I didn't know how to follow it up. And it's taken me, it took me a good few years to get back to the desk and start producing books I'm proud of again. I just, I just did not know how to follow that award success and that acclaim that, I, that I'd been craving <laughs> and that I'd been desperate for. And then when it was there, it was like, I can't, I can't deal with it. I, I don't know how to write the next book. The next book's got to be better. It's got to be bigger. It's got to be better. It's got to sell more. It's got to win more awards. It's, and I didn't know how to do that. And nowadays, it's just like, oh, well, I'll just write to the best of my ability and I'll write a story that I'll enjoy reading and we'll see where it goes. Is Ostrich Boy the, the book that you think that is the best book you've written? No, not at all. No. <laughs> it's, got, it's got my best jokes in it. It's got some really good jokes in it. Um, but no, there's books I prefer to Ostrich Boys. And this is what freaks you out as well as a writer. Because I, when I finish a book, I, I kind of think to myself, oh, yeah, that's, that's not bad. Or sometimes I think to myself, oh, that one's great. I loved that. I really enjoyed that experience. Um, And weirdly, the ones that I go, oh, that's great. I really enjoyed that experience. Haven't been as successful as the ones that went, mm. oh, well, that's okay. I, I, I tried my best. And so I ended up successful because because the audience is needed to help tell me, uh, not maybe not for my own enjoyment of the book, but whether this book will be successful yeah. in the outside world. You know? So you any, do you send it to, the, do you submit it to the publisher a manuscript that you think, oh, that's not bad, or you just leave it there for another month and you rewrite really it until it's great. Well, it's usually I'm up against deadlines. You know, I sign a contract, mm -hmm. I've got to hit that deadline, and I'm not great with deadlines. So the book that I handed in on the 20th of September should have been handed in on the 20th of August. Oh. So, you know, I don't get... So there wasn't... With that particular book, there wasn't much time for me to settle back and think about it but I try to if I can I try to give myself a good two or three months after finishing before I send it off to the publishers in case anything else pops into my head while I'm having a shower or cleaning yeah. my teeth or yeah. talking about publishers again you're saying that after the Ostrich Boy you didn't write another book for another two years yeah. you didn't have a contract for another publishing or did, did they allow you two years of freedom no I, I did I was on contract with Random House with Random House and I, I missed the deadline and oh. um, we talked about it you really are bad with deadlines I am bad with deadlines <laughs> but what I did was I edited a, a couple of collections of anthologies uh, collections of short stories anthologies 
So um, an editor that I'd worked with at Random House moved to a different publishing house and she said to me, I've got this great idea for an anthology of short stories, collection of short stories. Um, would you like to edit it? So I got to choose which authors I wanted uh, to be in this anthology and I wrote them and asked them to write a short story and I put the anthology together. And, mm-hmm. edit- and so I did two anthologies of other people's writing, which kind of reading other people and I got to choose writers I really liked and writers I really admired children's writers you know teenage writers and and that was a lovely experience and that kind of kept me going uh, in between ostrich boys and struggling to get the next book out yeah that's why you you broke up the relationship with Random House because of that uh, missed deadline or no uh, not exactly no I mean I'm still um, uh, I'm still uh, hoping to to be published by Penguin Random House at some point, and, and they still have my backlist. Oh, they still they still publish Ostrich Boys. It's still the okay before it. Yeah, so I've still got a, a good relationship with them, um, but I haven't actually written for them in a while. Um, the, I am working on a big chunky book at the moment, which I would like them to have a look at. Uh, mm-hmm. And if they listen to this podcast, I think they're wonderful people, mm-hmm. and they're all. Fantastic, and they're my favorite <laughs> publishing house. Yeah, oh, but really, the their designs and the paper they use and the font and all that. I mean, I, it seems standard, but I still like their books more. And every time I see a book that's published, so let's put it this way: if I see a book that is published by two different publishing houses or more, I would, and one of them is Penguin, I would always choose Penguin. Ah, oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so. Yeah, good job, Big Win Out. Yeah, good, good job, Peng. Uh, they, well, they do publish some fantastic authors. I do. Uh, last week, I was I, I had the massive, huge chance to visit the Hemingway House in Havana, mm-hmm. where he lived for his, I think, twenty to thirty years or something. It was massive. It, it was huge. It was beautiful. It was on the con- not on the countryside, but uh, on the outskirts of Havana, not in the city. And it was like a private residence, a big house. And when I was there, I thought, all right, I, I, I could also win a Nobel Prize if I <laughs> live and write from here. But do you think it's, I mean, I was joking, but do you think that's a big factor, the place where you're writing from to write good books, or you can also write from the basement if, you, if the story is there and if the focus is there and the goodwill is there? Um, I have a, an Ikea desk in my bedroom. Mm where I write um, I mean it's a nice bedroom <laughs> um, again I suppose it's the way you isolate yourself to write or the way you cocoon mm. yourself from the west of the world to be able to write I'm you know as we say I, I kind of I have to produce another book to keep going there are those writers out there that they can you know Hemingway uh, if he was still alive, would never have to write another book. Stephen King would never have to write another book in his life. I need to keep writing books. And I've got a very, very understanding partner who mm-hmm. sort of, you know, looks after the rent. And, and <laughs> stuff like that. She's got the job. She's, she's got the proper job. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, so, so perhaps if I ever had a huge bestseller, oh, yeah, I'd go for that, that luxury lifestyle. Yeah. But I'm not going to name any names. But I know a few writers who claim they can only write in certain circumstances when the muse mm. visits them. You know, when the great gods of literature descend upon them, and they can, and it's and they they need their their luxury space, perhaps, or they need their specific uh, totem mm. writing totem of a, mm. a cuddly toy or a certain pen or a certain pad or anything like that. Now, maybe I'm very lucky. I've never needed anything like I can write on a bus. I can write in a cafe. Right. Um, I, uh, the, the most recent book, as I say, um, I went to uh, we went on a holiday to London this year. Just uh, uh, my daughter's never been to London, and we went to went to London just for a few days. Um, and uh, my partner and my daughter they went to uh, the National Portrait Gallery in London, and I sat out in a park overlooking the Thames and wrote a chapter of my mm. book or the beginnings of a chapter of my book. Mm. So. I had my headphones on and music coming in, <laughs> but I can write anywhere. So I, the, the tricky thing here is 
Now, Hemingway is a genius, mm. absolute genius. And I am in no way claiming that I'm on any way of any parity to Hemingway's writing. I, I, I'm not saying that at all. So me claiming I can write anywhere, whereas somebody like Hemingway has his huge, luxury, gorgeous place to write, well, maybe I would be a better writer if I had that place. Who knows? And maybe yeah. Hemingway would have been a worse writer if he had an Ikea desk in his bedroom. <laughs> well, who knows? Let, let me tell you a curiosity, a little fun fact. Uh, what happened at his house is that he, he was also writing from his bedroom, by the way, and he didn't have an Ikea uh, desk, and he didn't even have a desk. He had a desk, but he never used it because he was writing standing one, was one of those writers. And he was just putting his typewriter uh, on a uh, chest of drawers and just writing from there. His wife, uh, Mary, built him a tower where supposedly he could go up there and stay alone and watch Havana from the top of it and had a sofa to relax and his desk and a telescope. He never wrote from that tower, <laughs> never even once didn't go there just to make her happy. Like, all right, you built this huge tower for me. He didn't go there. He still wrote from his bedroom. So his writing, his physical writing space was even smaller than yours with the Ikea desk. He was writing standing. He didn't even have the chair, use the chair. But the place surrounding him was silent and was beautiful and was green. He could take long walks without leaving his residence. And I guess in this case, it's the isolation we we're talking about. It wasn't music, but it was actually silence, what he maybe needed. It's possible. I, I think the best, the best way to be a writer is to be bored. I think we fill our lives with so much nowadays that mm. you can, you know, the Walkman, when that came out in the, what was it, the 80s, suddenly we could listen to music as we were walking along. And then podcasts, suddenly we yeah. our, our heads filled with these brilliant podcasts yeah. and we're learning things as we're going to work. And actually, no, just walk to work with nothing on, mm. no music, no uh, podcasts, nothing, and you'll get ideas for stories. Yeah, you, you know, it's sort of, so that isolation, I guess, is is where his ideas was maybe coming from. Um, but yeah, nowadays we, we've always got something else on our mind and it's often produced by someone else. I'm always fascinated that uh, I listen to... Um, uh, uh, TV writers, I saw an interview with a TV writer from the UK and he says, I don't watch much TV mm. um, because he wants to produce it. He doesn't want somebody else's TV right. going in. He wants to produce his own TV. Um, I mean, I believe you have to love reading to be a writer. Exactly. That's what I think it's a bit mm. different with uh, writing and reading. To be, I, I strongly believe that to be a good writer, you have to read a lot. I, I, I completely agree with that. Yeah, I completely agree. So, but with Producers and maybe even singers, like TV producers, music yeah, producers. There's, there's a couple of rock stars who don't really listen to music that much, you know. Cause yeah, maybe be, maybe it's different with music. Maybe it'd be interesting to find out, actually. Yeah, so, I should uh, invite a musician next time. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you, I don't know if you read anything or are you a fan of Murakami, Haruki Murakami? Um, he's a writer. Uh, I. I haven't read any, no, to my sin. It's one of, he's, he's... He's different. He's one of these writers. I have a shelf of shame. Most people's <laughs> shelf of shame is like dodgy books that they, they feel guilty about that, that they have read. My shelf of shame is guilt of books that I haven't read. <laughs> and yeah, Murakami is on my shelf. Who's it? Who else is on the show? Oh, no, no. You <laughs> Dickens. I've not read any Charles Dickens. Oh. Uh, and being British, of course, you know. That's what I was going to say. Should have read my Dickens. So there's Dickens, there's Murakami, um, there's, I've, I've not read any Margaret Atwood. Me neither. Um, she's she, on my shelf of shame. And my partner, she's a brilliant reader. So you see, what she does is usually read a book and goes, oh, this is fantastic. I loved it. And then she'll put it onto my shelf of shame because <laughs> she knows it'll take me ages <laughs> to get to it. Yeah. But he has a very interesting story how he became a writer. Maybe you can start with a sh short book that he has. It's called What I Talk About, where I talk about running. Because mm -hmm. he's a, yeah. he's, I've heard of it. Yeah. 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 He's also a crazy runner. He does at least one marathon per year. I mean, I don't know if he still does it because he's a bit old now. But he says that he just became a writer because he had a thought while he was watching a baseball game when he was 31. And he thought, all right, I, I want to be a writer. I mean, at, at least that's how he puts it. And this is a pretty 
famous uh, story among the reader, readers and writers community because he just clicked like that. He said, I'm going to be a writer. And what he did is that, or at least what he said, is that he never wrote a book because he was asked to write a book. Ah, okay. So I'm now talking about the opposite uh, of what you do. And I want to talk, I want to ask you what you think about that. I, he says, I know I have to write because I have to pay my bills. And it's a bit sad to hear it from, from him when he's 70 years old and he's very famous and he sold a lot of books and he still says, I have to keep writing to pay my bills. Yeah. Yeah. But he said, I never write because I'm asked. I only write when I have something to write. And sometimes I don't even have something to write. I just sit. I know I have to write something and the characters take me to the story. I don't write the story, the characters write the story. And if you read uh, two of his book, one is uh, the, win- the Wind Up uh, Bird Chronicle and the uh, Norwegian, not Norwegian, the, the Kafka on the Shore. Okay. You will notice that really the car- characters drive the story 100%. Mm-hmm. So it's, you, you never, you can't tell where the story is going or where it's going to go. Now, what, what is your approach? Would, would you be able to drop the contracts and just write whenever you want to write and whatever you want to write? When will that moment come? Um, I don't know when the moment will come in, in that sense, whether it'd be quite a solid moment as such an edge. Um, if I never got another book published, I'd still write. It's what I love doing. It's it, you know it's a hobby mm-hmm. and the thing I I enjoyed doing most in the world, writing that became, you know, um, a, 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 a vocation and a, and a, a career. Um, so if I never never got another book published ever, I'd still write because I love writing. Um, and I think it's like there's people who who play the guitar or play the piano, and they may may never get on, you know a huge stage somewhere, you know, um, to, to play gigs or, or whatever. But they'll always play the guitar, they'll always yeah. play the piano. Um, footballers, you know, people who play football for fun or go skiing, do you know what I mean? It's like mm. they'll never be in the Olympics, but they'll always ski. Yeah. Um, and that's that's me. I, I, I find so much pleasure in writing most of the time. Um, that, that that is something I'd never give up. I could be working, um, I you know, not as an accountant because that's what I failed at university, obviously. <laughs> but I could be working anywhere, you know. I yeah. could be doing whatever I'm doing, and I'd still find time um, in my week to go and write. Mm-hmm. The same as somebody'd find time to go play football or go play the guitar. So um, it's it's in the blood in a in a weird way, I suppose, the fact that I want to tell stories. And even if I'm just writing stories for my daughter or for my partner or for my friends, uh, that's what I'd still be doing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, are you, fr- you mentioned that you're friends with other writers. Yeah. Uh, is it an easy friendship to keep or it's a very competitive friendship? No, I, I've, I've, I'm not a very competitive person. No. Person or a writer? Both actually, but yeah, um, I'm, uh, and um, maybe that's to my downfall that I kind of, um, it's, maybe it's I don't, arguable if it's a downfall or not. Um, yeah, I, I'm just, uh, you know, I won't, I, I wouldn't uh, throw a friend under the bus with their book to make my book, you know, bigger or better or whatever, or get more attention. No, in the children's book world, it's really quite, it's quite cozy. The thing is, you got in the, the children's books are always uh, the poor cousin or the 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 ugly stepchild. They're the ones you know we uh, we don't get the kind of coverage in the newspapers or on television or wherever that the, the adult books get. Mm-hmm. Partly to do with sales because adult books sell and make more money. Um, so of course, children's books are. Do you know what I mean? They don't make as much money as adult books, so they're not seen as valuable. But also, when you think of the the literature that you're taught in universities and things like that, they don't teach so many kids' books. Uh, I get offended by that. I think kids' books, I, I think there's some kids' books out there that are far better than some adult books out there. Uh, and I've argued with adult writers um, and um, 
novelists of great and glorious award-winning literature that there is children's books that's just as valuable as theirs um and so in the children's book world we are we know that we're the underdog in the literary argument and so we kind of pretty much stick quite close together and we're very happy to help promote each other mm. and to to give each other quotes for the backs of the books and to yeah. you know and this kind of thing um it's it's not it's not an antagonistic um marketplace it's not a competitive sport no it's not you know there's uh, you know there's books that um that i prefer to other books and there's books that i read and go yeah oh, my god how did that get published um but that could be me i wouldn't have published as i said you know some of the famous books i don't like particularly um but no with other kids writers we get on quite well i have had arguments with you know uh old adult writers mm. not young adult writers uh about uh uh, the value of children's books. Mm. Um, so no, it's 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 not a competitive sport, right? Yeah. It's not at all. Well, as, uh, on the reader side, it's not that if you buy your book, you're not going to read anyone else's book. You read your book and someone else's book and someone else's book. So yes. it's not only one shot. No, that it's, you get on book. It's not, and and also, uh, people like me have managed to build a little bit of career in the UK because. Um, until fairly recently, but the UK, there was a school library in every high school mm. in the UK and in quite a lot of um, primary schools as well. There was a, a school library. So if your book wasn't on the shelves of the local bookshop, your book would be on the shelves of the local school library. And so they had to buy your book to put it on local. So yeah. you was getting sales through, yeah. you know, through school libraries. Did you get translations in other languages? Yeah, I'm translating into about twelve languages. Twelve, about twelve. Wow. Yeah, um, and it's it's funny which which language which countries choose you. So, um, uh, yes. Yeah, so uh, the cl- a book called The Climbers, which was my previous book, um, it's it's been published in German as Kletterton. Mm-hmm. Um, Ostrich Boys got published in German, and it was called. Ostrich Boys. Did uh, you publish it once you moved here? No, no, it was, um, it's not me that decides again. It's the publishers, they they meet up in publishing fairs around the okay. world and they exchange books and say, would you like our book and can mm. you translate it? Uh, but at the Climbers, uh, so it's been published in German, it just got published in Chinese this this month. Um, and it's fantastic to see it in Chinese. So we'll see how that goes. Um but yeah, China has picked up the climbers, but they've not picked up any other books. Mm. Italy published Ostrich Boys, but they have not published any of my other books. So it's strange who which country decides to pick up your book and which doesn't. Besides writing uh, your own books, uh, you also teach other people to write and you have co-founded the Sunday Writers Club, right? And where you don't 100% teach people how to write, but you write in groups and then share feedback, right? Yeah, that's right. Sunday Writers Club's not about teaching. I, I have taught, I've taught uh, both adults and children um, writing, uh, sort of, you know, going into schools. And I've worked with teachers as well back in the UK of how to, how best to do creative writing in a classroom situation, how to get the kids engaged, that kind of thing. Whereas Sunday Writers Club, um, it started just as a, so I moved to Vienna. Yeah. Um, I was uh, not a German speaker. Mm. And um, I sat at home at my desk in my bedroom all day. How the hell was I going to meet anybody and make friends? You know. So I decided that I'd set up an English speaking creative writing <laughs> group just to try and meet people. Uh, and luckily, I, I met this guy who's been in Vienna much, much longer than me. He's Australian, actually. He's interested in children's books, had a few short stories, not novels, published short stories, called Paul. And Paul and I created Sunday Writers Club. And the idea was we were just going to get as many English speaking writers together and we would write as a group and it would it would be nice to meet people yeah. uh, and uh, go into a, a, a Viennese cafe. Um, but it, it kind of grew. And um, when... Uh, COVID hit yeah. and lockdowns hit. We went online. That's where I also joined. Ah, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We went. It was online. more than two years ago. Yes. Yeah. Um, and now we've, we've, we're now an official culture for and um, we have members in 
Edinburgh and in Amsterdam and oh. in uh, Paris and Chicago. Um, so we have people join us online for our writing sessions, but it's it's more of a community than mm-hmm. actually a, a teaching resource. Um, we do have workshops. We invite authors because now that we're a frine, we yeah. can pay authors um, to uh, to run a, a creative writing workshop for us. Um, and actually, uh, we, we also do something called Meet the Professionals. What is that? It's uh, an hour-long session. And we do one once every month, every two months. It's online. And we invite a professional from the publishing industry to come to a question and answer session with our members. And so we've had uh, authors come along, but we've had a screenwriter. We've had uh, editors from the publishing industry. We had a translator. And it's just so that we can ask them how the publishing industry works. How did they get published? If they got any hints or tips and things Where like that. Where can I find out about it? It's on our website, Sunday Writers Club. Dot com is so our I website. have to subscribe to a newsletter or I just have No, to all the website. information would be on the website. Oh, um, uh, it, we have an annual membership and our annual members always get first pick of, mm. uh, if it's going to be a big audience, then they we, we give it to the members first. <laughs> But anybody can, you don't have to be an annual member to join in any of the, the sessions or anything like that. You just get extra benefits as an annual member. And it's the annual membership that helps us pay for the authors that come along. And we've just published our very first anthology of work. The Writers Club, the best of volume number one. Wow. Yeah, it's it's published here in Vienna? Yeah, we published it uh, just it has two a weeks cafe ago. logo. Just two weeks weeks ago um and um it's got 25 uh short stories poems uh reflections, reflections in this first ever sunday writers club co- co- collection yeah so uh, and that's all people that are members of sunday writers club that are, have written um who did you publish this with uh copy editing and design marie terezawa Yeah, Marie helped us to format it and do some copy editing. Um, she uh, created the Universe uh, Creative Writing um, Group in Vienna, which is a, a students, uh, Viennese students writing group. Mm-hmm. And uh, Marie helped us with the actual layout of the book and things like that. But we basically have published it as Sunday Writers Club. And we used Facultas to print it for us. Uh, Facultas are a Vienna-based printers. Mm. Um, so It's yeah. a very cool book. Um, we're, we're really pleased and it, it was nice to give the members something do you know what I mean so yeah. it's, um, it took us a year <laughs> it's, a, mm. it's a lot it's a steep well they said it takes one year to publish books. yeah well that's right yeah <laughs> um, so it took us a year to put it all together and to uh, to lay it out and print it up we've learned a lot because although I've had 24 books published I've never published myself If, does that make yeah, sense? Yeah. So yeah, actually, a publisher. Do, now becoming a publisher was 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 quite a, a stretch, but it's um, it was good fun, and we had a launch party at Pickwick's International Pub um, in the first district yeah. because they have a big screen where they usually show sports, uh, football games, and things like that. But what we could do was have some of our Viennese members reading their stories mm. and some of our international members on the screen on a Zoom reading their stories as well. So at a hybrid launch event, which was great fun. Yeah. Uh, the pub- the writers published here, they are only uh, Vienna inhabitants or they're part of the club worldwide? They're part of the club worldwide. So the, the Viennese writers in here, well, I mean, we say they live in Vienna, but they could be from yeah. wherever. Um, uh, but we've also, there are, There's two Scottish-based writers. There's two American-based writers in here. There's a there's a French writer who's in here. As long as they write in English, that's the only thing. Yeah. Um, And you do you do the Sunday Writers Club every Sunday? We do every Sunday. We meet on Sunday mornings in a cafe somewhere in Vienna mm-hmm. one week, and then the next week we're online. Okay. And then the following week we're in a cafe and then the next week we're online. So we kind of um, uh, alternate between a cafe in Vienna where we're face-to-face writing mm-hmm. and then online where you can zoom in from wherever you are in the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, all details, sundayrightsclub.com. And we're a, we're a Ferrine, so we're a not-for-profit yeah. uh, organization. We're doing it because we we just love meeting other writers. And there's been a few writers who... it's it's I say we don't teach... 
but people coming to us week after week, you can just see their writing get better. Mm. Whatever better writing is, you know, you can see them feeling more satisfied with what they produce and they're happier with what they produce. And that's great. That's really nice. Yeah. Yeah. Doesn't this just a funny and realistic question? Being there every Sunday, doesn't it come with a little bit of problem with your family? Uh, well, my... we can't travel this week. You have your Sunday Riders Club again. <laughs> well, luckily, as I say, there's uh, there's three of us that that run it. Mm-hmm. So there's this Australian guy Paul. So if I don't do a Sunday, he'll do a Sunday. Yeah, well, what happens if you both or to the three of you have a plan the same Sunday? Then my partner Yasmin she does a Sunday. So there's three of us that swap and change between Sundays. So admittedly, my family mm-hmm. commit quite a few Sundays because it's either me running it or it's my partner, Yasmin, running it. Uh, But Paul does run it as well. And we don't do it over, we have a break during December. Uh, we the whole month of December we don't run any sessions, and in all July and August we don't run okay. any sessions. So we've got two chunky breaks each year. Um, but we run a writers retreat. We take sixteen authors, writers up to a castle in the Lower Austria, and we have this whole castle to ourselves for four nights. And we interested is that? Right. It's on the website. So say yeah. it's on the website. Look, where is the next one planned? Um, April or May. We, we we've done it twice, two years running so far. One year in May, one year in April. Um, it's it's just good fun. You you go to this castle, um, and we have to cook for ourselves uh, and we we run a sort of a a Sunday writers club session in the morning and then we just disappear right by ourselves in the castle grounds in the afternoon wow Um, it's really I'm really interested either Uh, uh, you'd be very very welcome to uh, to have a look and see what you think uh, it's been already more than four years since I published my first and last book so far so I have to decrease a bit my uh writing skills or novelist skills not not writing skills mm-hmm. because i have always kept writing uh, uh, uh screenplays during all this time but it's been a while since i write short stories or okay well, i've well, never written a novel we are a good guilt trip on a <laughs> sunday morning everybody else is writing and you think bloody hell i better start writing yeah, too. Well, that's yeah. a good guilt trip but if, do you know what you're going to write next have you got i know you've got uh, an that's idea the problem because it's a very long story okay and it's a very complicated story, very complex because it comes from my country. Okay. And it's not just a story that I have to tell. I have to explain a lot of this. Like I have to explain a lot of things before, so the readers can understand how these, the why things work like that. I see. So, so you, you, uh, when you write, are you a big planner? Do you like to have everything planned out? Or? No, not 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 really. Okay. Uh, or maybe, maybe that's why I haven't written it yet. Right. Because I like to have it planned. I don't know yet. I've never written a novel before. So that would be the first time. Yeah. Uh, but I, I don't want to rush it also. Yeah. yeah. So I talked already to a publisher here in Germany. Okay. He was he had a very, very small publishing house. And he liked the, the, the story, the idea. And he said, once you write it, send it to me. So this is something that encourages me to sit and write. But it's been more than two years that I have talked to this publisher. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it means that I'm not that motivated yet. So what's stopping you? Do you know what's... Time. Time. I'm a student. I'm a full-time student. Okay. And uh, when you have to write and read a lot for university, it really there's little time and energy to write for something else. I can understand that, yeah. Um, I think when you're using your head, your brain... Uh, all day long to yeah. then have to sit down and use yeah. your brain, your head to, to write yeah. as well. I, I think that's that's really tricky. I would yeah. prefer to be a waiter and keep my brain fresh and then just go home and write. Yeah, well, I, that is, that's the way I worked. Yeah. I, I, you know, I was very young, obviously, but yeah, that's definitely the way I worked it. it, it I've met quite a few, working in schools, I've met a few teachers, English teachers that would love to be writers, but I think they're using their heads so much in the classroom that, it, that yeah. to get home and then... So, find that energy that that mental mm. imaginative energy again so it, it's tough uh, so i can yeah. understand your predicament yeah. Right? yeah but there are a lot uh maybe not a lot but here in austria there are uh like writers stipendium like a scholarship that they do i'm not sure so there there are okay there are some but of course it's not easy to get them because it's austria why things should be easy <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> but i mean if 
if you or someone who is listening to this wants to try it out and just can't write because it's too busy working, maybe you can try that thing out. It will, it, they pay you, I think, for a year okay. with a normal salary just to pay your bills and uh, expenses. And then you have to come up, you have to come up with a novel by the end of, uh, I think, the year. Yeah. Which is not a bad deal no, for people a, who the only reason not to write is because they're too busy working. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's the problem. The, the time commitment is, stop paying how are you going to stop paying the bills and run yeah, yeah you can especially if you're an immigrant and you don't have a yeah. uh, mother or father to go to for those six months or one year so where would you uh, do you know who you need to apply to is it this sort of kind of a cultural I can find that out yeah. and send it to you because okay. I don't know it by heart right now but it's something like uh, book stipendium book yeah. schreiber stipendium or something I'd be interested like to put something like that on our Sunday Rights Club website yes you know, so yes, yes 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 kind of definitely the, something good. they can use there yeah. But they require, I read, uh, like a 30-page uh, description of what the novel's going to be like. Okay. Yeah. So that's why I said it's not an easy thing. It's not, you just you don't just submit, you apply with your idea. Yeah. They I, want more. I guess it's going to be quite competitive as well. So Also yeah. that, yeah. that most probably they would prioritize uh, German-speaking writers. Yes. Yeah. Why not? Yeah, they are the. It's the Austrian fund, of and course. they want to promote uh, German-speaking writers. That Absolutely, they yeah. So, awesome. but uh, I recommend that whoever wants to try it. Please try it and let us know how Yeah, let us Absolutely. <laughs> we are very yeah, curious know. about it. Yeah. One last thing I want to ask you, though. What is your... Uh, what would be one point for you in your life as a writer that you would consider that you achieved what you've been looking for? And maybe you can sort of retire, not... I mean, you, you're not working full-time employed somewhere and you don't have to retire like that, but retire like, all right... This is it. I I had what I was looking for. This is what I was looking for to write. Or to win. Could be an award, could be a book, could be the novel that you wanted to write all the time, but you never had time because of the commitment. Yeah, the problem is, I think, a little bit similar to I was saying that artists of any kind, uh, writers are, you know, whether it's a writer or an artist or, or whatever, you're never... You're never satisfied with your work. You know, you'd always go back and maybe change something. Mm. You know, nothing's ever perfect. Nothing ever turns out as perfect as you want it. And I think actually, if you ever did write a novel and it turned out absolutely perfect and you thought it was the best piece of writing ever, then you should give up. Where's the challenge? Um, that's, you know, uh, I don't agree with that kind of um, that kind of arrogance. Mm. That, oh, what I wrote was perfect. Um so the problem was, all I wanted to do was get a book published. That was it. That was the be all and end all. In my early 20s, late teens, early 20s, the only thing I wanted to do was get a book published. Mm. The problem was I got a book published and then the only thing I wanted to do was get a second book published. <laughs> and then the only thing I wanted to do was to hit a short list of a big prize. Mm. And then the only thing I wanted to do was become a full-time writer. And then the only thing I... I don't think it'll ever end. I am far too greedy and far too needy. <laughs> but what is the next thing then? For me, the next thing would be... The next thing, actually, I've got an 11-year-old daughter. The next thing would be for my daughter to read one of my books and oh. tell me she loved it. Now, she's a big reader. She loves books. Um, all three of us in the house are huge, huge readers. Um, but I don't think she's ever dared read one of my books. She never read any of your books? Well, some of them are too old for her, you know, because so, I write for teenagers yeah. mainly. So there's, there's there's sex, drugs and rock and roll in my older books. So that may be, you know, a little bit too old for her. Um, and I think she's nervous of reading them in case she hates Papa's books mm. because she has her favourite authors. And what happens if she reads one of my books? And or they are her favourite other authors. Sorry? Who are the, her favourite uh, authors? She loves the Harry Potter books. Oh. Uh, she loves uh, Percy Jackson, you know, oh, yeah. the, uh, Percy Jackson books. Um, there's a couple of other authors that she really likes. Um, an author called Sophie Anderson who writes uh, sort of mythic books for children. Fantastic, right, Sophie Anderson. So... Um, yeah, she has a lemony snicket. Do you know lemony snicket? I love yeah, lemony Yeah, she snicket. loves lemony snicket. So what What if she 
dares to read one of Papa's books and it's just a bag of crap, you know, she'll be upset, I'll be upset. So I but whether she will ever read one of my books. Is she asking you to read them and you're not letting her? No, not at all, not at all, not at all. It's just, uh, it's one of those kind of, you know, the unspoken things. If she would never reads one of my books, okay, I, I'll understand, you know, I'll understand. Um, but I'd love her to read one of my books and go, do you know what, Papa, that was great. I, I love that. That was good. But it might not happen until she reads one of my older books till she's 13, 14. But the problem is when she reads the book, she's just going to hear my voice, isn't she? She's going to hear me yeah. as her Papa, not, not you know, because she knows me so well, obviously. So the books for her are going to be a, a more difficult read than they would be for a stranger. But yeah, I'd quite like, if that's possible, and actually I'd like my German to be good enough that I could read one of my German books to her. Mm -hmm. so, you know, it's one of the translations of the books and we could read it together in German. That'd yeah. be quite nice. So now my, my goals are a little bit more sentimental than they are actually yeah, lovely. career driven you know but are you uh, learning German at the moment yes I'm, I'm trying to learn German and I keep telling my partner and my daughter to speak German uh -huh. around the house to, to just so that I can yeah, practice because I'm missing out I think that because my German's still poor I'm missing out on a lot of what Vienna has to offer Vienna is such an easy city to live in if you only speak English but God, I think you miss out on some really cool stuff that happens in Vienna yeah. if you only speak English. That's exactly the conversation I was having earlier with a friend of mine, because I hear a lot of people say that here you can easily get along in English and you don't really need German to live in Vienna. That's true, but you are so limited by only absolutely. speaking yeah, English. Absolutely. And it's like, it's perfect, but inside your bubble or who else's bubble, not yours personally. And once you learn German, this bubble is broken and you see that there are so much more things yeah, yeah. To, to learn and people to meet and stories to share and connections to make and even uh, job opportunities, monetary opportunities yes, out yeah. there, business opportunities. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And that's why I'm trying my best. I'm, yeah. you know, trying my hardest. So uh, my excuse is I'm, I'm writing all day and then I've got to find that energy and that mental capacity <laughs> to learn German at night. But um but my daughter was in a play at school, you know, a school play. Yeah. And I went to see my daughter in a school play. Didn't understand a bloody word. I had to laugh when other people laughed, you know. <laughs> so my ambition is to go to see a school play and yes. what's happening. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great motivation to, yeah. to so, learn. Sure. Um, so, yeah, that's why I'm, I'm, I'm trying my hardest at the moment to learn German. It's tough. And I'm an old man. Yeah. Um, no. So, no. so uh, it's, it's, it's uh, and I say, I'm, I'll get there. I'll get there. Yeah. And uh, I do like language. So I enjoy seeing some connections between English and German sometimes. And, um, you know, there's a, there's a playfulness that I can bring to mm. learning German, I hope, I think, in my love of finding new words mm. and finding new descriptions. So, so yeah, um, that's it. I'd, uh, I'd like my daughter to read one of my books in English and I'd like to read one of my books to her in German. So they're, they're my new goals, I suppose. Well, I'm curious to talk to you again once these things are accomplished. Let's see what's going to be the next Absolutely. goal. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, sundaywritersclub.com, it's the link is in the description of this podcast. Just check it out. And if you ever thought about writing and you never found the courage or you're afraid that what people are going to think if they read it, you shouldn't be afraid and this is the right club to check it out and to get some feedback and to see i i don't think i don't remember that you are only uh supportive in the sense that uh, you always said that's great that's beautiful let's keep doing it you also give very constructive feedback yeah, we do we have a a once a month feedback group which we call writers lab live mm -hmm. which is the the criticism yeah. side for what we do yeah where because that's what writers need as well yeah. not just to say they're great even when they are not they need to get better not just to to approve their skills as that's they are right now so and uh do you have a link in the description how to order your book online when we live in Austria? Uh, my personal... And Amazon? Uh, yeah, Amazon. Amazon okay, uh, the some link of them there. are on Amazon.de, but most of them on .co.uk. Okay, let's check out also the link in the description. And is there any book, if they only had a budget to buy only one of your books, which one should they buy? Um, Just keep in mind that our readers are, our uh, listeners are not young adults. No, not young adults. <laughs> uh, well, actually, you can, if 
uh, there's a couple of book, bookshops actually in Vienna that stock my books. There's Talia, which stock mm-hmm. a couple of my books, but there's also um, a brilliant, brilliant indie bookshop called Analog on Otterbauer Gasser. It's, it's right sick. here. Yeah, it's really close. Seventh like district or sixth district. Sixth district, just the other side of yeah. Hilferstrasse, uh, called Analog Bookshop. And they've got uh, copies of uh, my newest book in there called The Den. And it's it's one of my favourite bookshops in Vienna. It's just fantastic, really friendly. A tiny, tiny little English section. Um, but uh, Analog bookstore. Analog, uh, analog books on Autobahn. Yeah. So, what, what if I'm far from that? Can I still order the Den online? Oh, is it, yeah, absolutely. You can order the Den. On Amazon? On Amazon. Okay. Yeah, you'll find it on Amazon. Absolutely. Okay. Well, it was great talking to you. Thank you very, thank you very much. much. No, thank you.